So we've been in a series called The Radical Call of Following Jesus, and we're looking at the radical community this morning. And I think the term church is used extremely loosely in our culture today. You see, for example, if you can actually believe it, there are such things as atheist churches that are popping up around the world. You actually see the picture on the screen of their logo. It's the first church of atheism. Go ahead, Garrett, and put that next picture on the, on the slide there. The first church of atheism. This is a real thing. People are gathering together as atheists to talk about current issues, to bond together as friends, to motivate others to good behavior. This is a real thing. But then the next thing, this is actually, there is actually now what's called the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster, or what they actually call themselves, Pastafarianism. Okay? And this deity is actually was initially created as a satire to actually ridicule Christians for their belief in a creator. So this whole thing is actually a huge joke, but they do have their own religious texts, their own website, their own meeting places that they gather together even though it's all based on a joke. But I think as Christians, sometimes we don't even fully understand the idea of what a church is and what it's supposed to be. Some take it to mean the building where people meet or going to a service or even that the building itself is somehow this sacred temple and we shouldn't say or, certain do, or, cer or do certain things because we're in church and yet we have no problem saying or doing those things when we're outside the walls of the church. You see... We've lost the beauty of what God has created his church to be. You see, to give a quick summary, according to the New Testament, it's a gathering of people who have put their faith in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. You see, the church is, is the people, it's not the building. It's the fellowship, not the service. It's not a sacred temple in which you act reverently before God, but where you learn to live as a temple of God, to live in a reverent way throughout the rest of your life. You see, we must remember this powerful truth to truly live in the radical call of following Jesus. And so when we forget what the community of the church is supposed to be, we render it incapable of making any impact on the world around us. So rather, putting our faith in Christ places us into a radical community that is generous, devoted to Jesus, and devoted to caring for one another. And so what we're going to look at this morning are the four marks of a radical and biblical church community. So I invite you to turn to Acts chapter 2 in your Bibles. We're going to be looking at verses 42 through 47. And so I just want to remind us where this series has been going. This is the radical call of following Jesus. This series is about seeing how being a follower of Jesus is far more than just praying a prayer one time to have your sins forgiven and to go to heaven someday when you die. But it's a life of extreme and counter-cultural obedience to Jesus and joining him on his rescue mission to save the world from their sins. And so when we look at the book of Acts. The book of Acts is the second volume that, the, that Luke the physician wrote. The first one, the Gospel of Luke, it is this book that shows who Jesus is and what he did. And then secondly, the book of Acts is all about how the church continued through the acts of the Holy Spirit, working through them to continue what Jesus did. And so last week we saw that Jesus told the apostles to wait for the Holy Spirit to come and fill them so that they would be enabled to go on on mission and be his witnesses around the world and make disciples of all nations. So here's what happened after the story we looked at last week at the beginning of Acts chapter 1. After that, they actually do. They follow through on what Jesus told them to do. They wait in Jerusalem and then they bring on this man named Matthias to replace Judas Iscariot as the 12th apostle, the, the man who had betrayed Jesus, Judas. Uh, and then in chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes as prophesied, as talked about. The Holy Spirit comes on to the apostles. They now are speaking in, this miracle happens, it's called speaking in tongues. And when you look at it from a scriptural standpoint, what's happening is it's, this miraculous enabling of speaking languages people did not know before. So it'd be like this. It'd be like if you've seen a proceeding at the United Nations and you, do, you see how a person is speaking their native tongue up front and then they have people with in, in their ears getting translated. So the representatives have people in their ears translating what is being said up front. Instead, it'd be like you wouldn't, we wouldn't need that translator because you would just hear that person in your original language and all the people would be hearing it that way. 
That's what happened. That is a crazy miracle. This is God speaking. It happened on a day that they called Pentecost. And there would be a ton of people in the city at Pentecost. They were celebrating this festival, this wheat harvest, commemorating the anniversary of the day when God gave the law to Israel at Mount Sinai. And so this is this moment, at this moment where the Holy Spirit has now come, Peter stands up and he preaches the first recorded gospel sermon. And here's kind of the content of what he says. He says that Jesus was crucified according to God's plan on, and it was done on our behalf to pay the price for our sins and that Jesus was raised to life to show that this payment was enough to cover the debt of our sins. And that Jesus, this same Jesus ascended into heaven and he and sits at the right hand of God and and from there poured out his Holy Spirit on those who would put their faith in Christ. And so when Peter is done preaching, the people around go, what, what do we do with this? It says they were convicted. They were cut to the heart and they said, what do we do? And Peter says, repent of your sins. Turn away from them. Turn to Jesus instead. Confess that you are a sinner. Turn to Jesus. Look to him for forgiveness and he will make you new. And he says as well to be baptized so that you would identify yourself with Jesus, that you or your old self would be die, would die and would be buried and be pulled up. Your new life would be pulled up out of the grave. You'd be raised to new life just like Jesus. And so as a result of this preaching, 3,000 people came to Christ in one day. That's huge. It's an incredible movement of God. And so what we're going to see today is now what happens immediately after that amazing thing. What is the church going to look like? What are they going to do? How are they going to act now that this Holy Spirit has come and there are now thousands of people who believe in Jesus? And so what we're actually going to do is I'm going to invite you to stand up. We're going to read uh, this together this morning. There's only six verses, so go ahead and stand up. Stand up. We're going to read the six verses together um, because it's only six. So we'll read them uh, and then we will explain them. So here we go. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Let's take a moment to pray. God, we pray that we would surrender ourselves to your word. Jesus, that we would devote your, ourselves to it. And God, we would hear what you have to say. God, we would be convicted where we need to be convicted. And God, we would be encouraged where we need to be encouraged. And God, follow you more closely because of the preaching of your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me take a seat. So right off the bat, we get to verse 22. It says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. You see, this new community, they're rejoicing in their forgiven sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit that's now been poured out on them. And remember, this Holy Spirit, for them, for the first century Jews, they would think, oh no, the Holy Spirit was, would come on in specific instances or it would fill the temple. But now they're being told, no, it will fill you when you put your faith in Jesus. And so they're rejoicing in this crazy turn of events. And that each one of the things now that are listed in this verse quite literally can be read at like this because the definite article is listed in there that we would translate as the, okay? This is how it would read. The fellowship, the teaching, the breaking of bread, and the prayer. So it gives us this concept that these were not just things they were doing, but these things were included in some of the ways that they would have their services. These were constantly part of what they were doing. And so this expression right at the beginning, devoting themselves, has the idea of persistence or persevering in something. It's more than just a one-time thing, but an ongoing loyalty and devotion to knowing and understanding what the, the apostles were teaching about Jesus. And honestly, this is why studying our Bibles is so crucial for us, because it shows the level of our devotion to God and, and desiring to understand what it is that he has taught. And so you got to ask yourself this question, would you characterize your study of God's word as persistent and persevering? I don't know about you, but sometimes not for me. 
It's not. Sometimes I'm studying and it feels more like, you know, rote obedience. I'm just doing it because it's a habit or I'm doing it because I feel like I'm supposed to. But persistence, and there have been times where it, I've ignored it. So we need to say, we need to be persistent. We need to be devoting ourselves fully to this teaching. And so we have to understand as well that the apostles' teaching, it was authoritative because this was given to them. These things were given to them by Jesus himself to then spread to all people who would believe in Jesus. This is why we look at the Bible as God. God's word. Or what we would actually say, as Paul would actually say in 2 Timothy 3, he would actually say this is God breathed. Like God breathed this thing into existence. This is from his inspiration. And so the New Testament in particular is an incredible record of what the apostles taught from Jesus. And it shows truly that instruction in our beliefs and practices is an essential part of what it means to be a church. This is what we need to be doing and that's why we are doing it right now. And so then secondly, he talks about fellowship. And the word for fellowship here is the Greek word koinonia. I love this word. See, this term speaks of communion or fellowship, typically describing the mutuality that takes place within a marriage. It's about shared activity, which includes mutual material support. You see, Luke uses this word to show that there is this incredible sense of connection between each of the members of the early church. So we have to ask ourselves the questions, do we feel this same way? about our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ in this very room? Do we feel that kind of special connection that there is something more to them than just people we go to church with? Because we have to understand that there's far more to this idea of fellowship than just simply being in the same room or doing some shared activity. What it really is is it's this sharing of our lives with one another. It's being vulnerable. It's being honest. And so this is why we provide things like community groups and discipleship because we need to have brothers and sisters in Christ who will encourage us, mutually encourage each other to spur us on to follow Jesus more closely. We need each other. And so one of the other practices, the third thing, the breaking of bread, this was about mutual acceptance. You see, because in that culture, sharing meals meant viewing your table mates as equals. And so that's part of the reason why the Jews would not want to eat with Gentiles because they thought they were breaking the law by doing that, by viewing Gentiles as their equals. Because it creates this intimate interaction and mutual acceptance. And so have you ever noticed that, how sitting down with, to a meal with somebody, with other people, can create that beautiful bond of friendship? And so that's what's going on here. This was a regular part of their church life. And then this fourth thing, this prayer, it's this dependence upon God and seeking God's direction. Uh, Daryl Bach, who I uh, read, a New Testament scholar, talks about this passage. This is what he has to say. God's family of people do not work by feelings or intuition, but by actively submitting themselves to the Lord's direction. You see, prayer is far more than just praying something that we can hope to get from God someday, but it's actually a submitting to God's direction, to God's leading, to God's guidance to say, God, what do you want for me to do? What do you, where do you want me to go? And that's what they were doing as a church. They were saying, God, where do you want us to go? What do you want us to do as a body of Christ? And so when we see all of this, we see what our first mark is, is that they had a devotion to the teachings of Jesus, prayer and fellowship with other believers. So I want you to catch the drift here because as Americans who come from a very individualistic culture, we can miss the beauty of of this story. You see, they were devoted to doing these things together as a corporate body of people. And certainly, there is a time and place for us to do these things individually, you know, take our own Bible study, take our own time for prayer. But if we are not doing these as part of a group of other people, we're missing out on a huge part of how Jesus designed our church to function. This is, this is what we are designed for. But here's kind of an issue. The problem here is that far too many people who claim to be followers of Christ do not show devotion to God's word. And it's backed up by studies. Check this out. Ed Stetzer, uh, a church researcher, in an article he wrote in 2015, this is what he wrote. A recent Lifeway research study found only 45% of those who regularly attend church read the Bible more than once a week. 45% of people read the Bi and who re regularly attend church read the Bible more than once a week. That's not much, actually. Over 40% of the people attending read their Bible occasionally, maybe once or twice a month. And check this out. Almost one in five churchgoers say they never read the Bible. Essentially the same number who read it every single day. 
So you see these extremes. And here's what results from that, from that lack of studying the Bible, lack of reading the Bible, is what we would call a problem of biblical illiteracy. That people, even in churches, don't know what the Bible actually says. Check this out. They also found that one in five people who claim to be evangelical Christians believe that there are many ways to heaven. That's actually one of the basic tenets of being an evangelical Christian is believing there is only one way to heaven, and that's Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. There is no other way to heaven except through him. So one in five evangelical Christians believe there's many ways? That's disturbing. And more than half of evangelicals, 59%, believe the Holy Spirit is a force and not a personal being. Everybody, that is Star Wars. That is not biblical Christianity. The Holy Spirit is not a force. He is a person who can dwell within us. And so as part of this study, they found several indicators that contributed to greater engagement for people with the Bible. And so, which would contribute to a greater devotion to the teachings of Jesus and the fellowship of other believers. Here's the eight that they mentioned. I'm going to read them really quick. Confessing sins and wrongdoings to God and asking for forgiveness. Following Christ, Jesus Christ for years. Being willing to obey God no matter the cost. Praying for the spiritual status of unbelievers. Reading a book about increasing spiritual growth. Being discipled or mentored one-on-one -on -one by a more spiritually mature Christian. Memorizing Bible verses. And lastly, attending attending a small group focused on Bible study. So if you think about that, notice that a lot of these things, pretty much all these things we provide in some way here at the church. You have the journals where you can memorize scripture and you can take time studying the Bible. We have community groups where you can study the Bible together. We have discipleship where you can meet with other people to learn what it means to follow Christ more closely. And, you know, I can give, you know, reading books about spiritual growth, I know I can give you some recommendations, Pastor Micah can give you recommendations, Beth and Jen, anybody who works on staff here, Ron and Christine can all give you recommendations. We have them, okay, about what you can do. So if you want to see yourself grow in your devotion to the Bible and Jesus, step out and become part of a small group. Get yourself discipled. Read a good book about spiritual growth. Find ways that you can grow so that this is not just something that you come to occasionally, but this is something that you become devoted to, to learning and understanding the teachings of Jesus and how to fellowship with other believers. Let's continue, verse 43. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. See, the word used for awe here is the Greek word phobos, which is where we get the word phobia, you know, arachnophobia, okay, something like that. So it's not just an awe as in, oh, that's really cool. I think that's amazing. That's awesome. But it's an awe that has a little bit of a tinge of fear in there as well. You see, it gives this concept of a careful, respectful, and even nervous notice of what God was up to within the community. And so this is showing, this is not just some momentary panic, but showing people are truly entering into a lasting sense of awe of God's work. And it connects back to something that they talk about a lot in the Old Testament called the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You see, we need to have a slight little bit of fear and respect for God, for who he is, and not sugarcoat that a little bit, but recognize he is powerful, he is strong, he is mighty. And so what was causing this feeling of awe? It's the signs and wonders that the apostles were performing. Because these signs and wonders showed a replication of Jesus' activity throughout the Gospels, and that God is supporting this new community of people to work on his behalf. And so as a little bit of a side note here, I personally believe from my own study of the Bible and kind of looking through some of these, uh, some of these miraculous gifts that were happening, like healing, prophecy, speaking in tongues, like I talked about earlier, these things were happening as a way to say, hey, that person comes from God. They speak the very message of God. Because God was bringing in something that was important, that was new, that was different. And so God wants to say, I am validating this. This is true. You see this with Moses. Moses can perform miracles because he's saying, I'm from God. So he's backing it up. Same thing from Elijah because they were going through a time where there was major uh, distance from God, where they were rejecting God. And so Elijah came to speak and so he performed miracles. You see that with Jesus. Jesus is bringing in this new kingdom. And so now you're also seeing it with the apostles. They're performing these signs, basically saying, we come from God. 
And we can back it up and show you why that is. And so the people's reaction was because they knew they were witnessing the dawn of a new age of the church, this new kingdom that was entering the world through the activities of the Holy Spirit through the apostles. And so the scope of this reaction, it's everyone. Everyone, what I think they mean here is everyone who was in the church. They're looking at this, they're going, this is amazing, this is crazy. We cannot believe this is happening. And so this leads us to our second mark, is that we have a reverential awe at the work of God among the people. You see, I think the signs that we would see nowadays of God's work among us are the lives of those within our church who have been radically transformed by Jesus. But many of us continue to believe in some ways that God cannot and will not change us. Or we continue in patterns that actually impedes God's work in our lives. We allow pride to twist our minds to think we're just fine the way that we are. And we don't need God to work. We don't need God to change us. Yet we also at the same time can become frustrated with ourselves when we make mistakes. We get frustrated when we, think, when we say, oh man, I wish I just wasn't that way. We can sometimes allow our time to get away from us and prioritize our ways of rest and entertainment instead of taking time to pursue growth and maturity in Christ. And yet we continue to be frustrated and saying, God, what are you doing? God, where are you? Well, it's because we're not pouring ourselves into him. Or sometimes we allow self-sufficiency to keep us from being honest and vulnerable with other believers in Christ who could encourage us. And I truly think this is another form of pride where we're just protecting ourselves from people. Yet we long for real relationships where we want to be truly known by others who love us and care for us and want to show us the truth. But here's, I think, one of the reasons why we avoid this. Because if we, we know that if we allow ourselves to have God work in our lives, it will often be hard and painful. You see, one of my favorite little parts of uh, the Chronicles of Narnia written by C.S. Lewis, it's in The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. It's this scene where this new character named Eustace, he's the cousin of the Pevensies, and he's a stuck-up rich kid. Arrogant, stubborn, really annoying, drives the Pevensey kids crazy. And so he gets taken into Narnia, and he's having a horrible attitude about it the entire time that he's there. And so then he stumbles into this magic cave where there's this treasure that's in there. And he starts to covet it. He starts to want it. And so he takes one of the bracelets and puts it up on his arm and he admires it. But not too long after, he falls asleep. And when he wakes up, he wakes up as a dragon, full on, full body dragon. And he's confused. He's frustrated. And eventually he has his heart softened. He realized that the dragon, his appearance as a dragon was what was going on in his heart. And he needed a change of heart. So when he meets Aslan, the lion, the Christ figure, he comes to him. He says, do you want me to do this? Do you want me to turn you back into a boy? He says, yes. And Aslan pulls out the claws of the lion. And he knows what that's going to mean is that's going to be painful. And so Aslan starts to quite literally scrape away the scales from Eustace. And eventually he becomes a boy once again. But here's the reality. It's the same happens for us. God often will peel away the scales of our hearts to make us new people. But we have to allow for him to do it, knowing it's going to be painful. Knowing that, but what, what he's doing this, he's doing it for our good and he wants to remove some of these things from our lives that we've held onto dearly. So that's why we would say this is a reverential awe. This is somewhat of a fearful awe because we know God could do something in our lives that will be painful, but it's worth it. It's good but that we also look around at other people who God has changed, who God has worked in, and we say, man, God can do it. God will do it. God is willing. He wants to do these things. And so that we look around and we see, man, look at what God is doing among us. And we ask him and believe that he will do these things. Let's continue verse 40, 44. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. So that what's going on here is that all the believers suggest those who have responded in faith to the gospel message that Peter had preached earlier in the chapter. And the fact that they were together shows not just a physical proximity, but also a relational unity. The word common in Greek is koina. It's shortened for koinonia. And this shows the depth of fellowship and mutual care within the community and the generosity that was being shown. Because, spoiler alert, everything in this passage means everything. 
It's not necessarily a trick there. And the kind of sharing, this kind of sharing that was happening here was actually viewed as a virtue in Greek cultures to share at this level. And as well, in many Middle Eastern cultures, hospitality is a supreme value for them. Even to the expense of themselves, they will be hospitable to others. And so even though, even though that's the case, this is still a miraculous occurrence that is happening amongst this people because it's being done on a very large scale. And so I want to make sure to clarify something because this, I have had this happen to me before. Somebody has suggested this to me before. This passage is not suggesting that communism is the way to go, okay? That God is all about communism. It's, he's not, okay? It's actually the opposite because this was a voluntary act of generosity stirred by the Holy Spirit to care for brothers and sisters in Christ who were in need. You see, there's websites all around the internet that's talk, that do this, Caring Bridge, GoFundMe, things like that where we can care for people who have genuine need. And, the, and we have to recognize this was a constant thing that was actually happening within the life of the church. When you look at verse 45, it says, they sold property and possessions to give. The verbs sold and give were written in Greek in what's called the imperfect tense. And what this means is that this was a process that was continual, being done over and over again, not just one big massive event where all the rich people downsized and then distributed to people who had need, but basically like... This person has a need. This rich person says, I'll sell this thing so I can take care of that person. Constant, ongoing. It was genuine care, not being done out of force, out of law, out of compulsion, done from the generosity of their own hearts. And so the picture that Luke portrays here is, a, is of a community that cared for all of its members, especially those who had material needs. And so the craziness of all of this is that Luke is doing something extremely fascinating here. Through this whole passage, Luke is showing how God's new temple that the Israelites had all kinds of hope for, this temple of God, was actually not, was now not going to be a building, was going to be his people that he dwelled in. Remember that Holy Spirit dwelling in people? Crazy idea. This was what it was. That whole, God's new temple was his new covenant family, and this is how they were acting. They were acting as a family. Because you act differently with family. You take care of family needs, right? So we are a body, when we are a body of Christ, we take care of each other and our family's needs within the body. Because that's what you do. And we have to look at this differently. So this is our third mark, that we are united in caring for the needs of our brothers and sisters in Christ. The motivation was to care for those who had genuine need. And what's amazing is the, the nation of America is actually, the uh, last year, was the fourth most generous nation in the world in terms of charitable giving. And they actually, and we actually scored pretty high as well in terms of uh, helping out strangers. But we did not do well on volunteering our time. We scored pretty low on that as a country. And so what we cannot misunderstand sometimes is we, I think we often have an issue of we give money to these nonprofits, these charities, let them take care of the work. Or we do these momentary, oh, let's help a stranger and then we'll move on with the rest of our day. Instead of volunteering our time to say we are going to take care of this as, as an ongoing thing. You see, my point is though, if, that if we exclusively focus on just giving money to charities or just helping strangers at random times, we lose the humanity that people who have need have. They are human beings in need of so much more than just a handout. And so what this means is what was going on in the church at this time is that those who were in positions of wealth were made fully aware of the needs within the church and, and made sure that they sold their possessions to help those who had these needs. Because we have to understand this. Wealth is not necessarily something that is a sin, but it's what you do with wealth. Because here's what Jesus has to say, a few things he has to say. In Luke 12, he says, don't hoard wealth for oneself, but be rich in God instead. And he says, you can't serve both God and money. And he also says, those who have been given much, much is expected in terms of generosity. And so here's the deal, is it has to come from a cheerful heart. It has to come not out of compulsion, not out of a, a, a form of self-righteousness, but out of a genuine, radical generosity to say, I am going to give because I want to make sure other people are taken care of. I want to give because I want to see, I don't want to see anybody in our church have any sort of need. There's another time where they do this in Acts chapter 4. Look at this. 
All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. A couple things to notice here. First of all, no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. They had, like it said earlier in the passage of, that we've been studying this morning, they had everything in common. They were sharing. Basically, they were holding it all with an open hand, saying, this is God's first and foremost. This isn't mine. This is God's. God has given these things to me so that I can be a blessing to others, so that I can care for others who have a genuine need. So this wasn't some... Again, out of compulsion, it was a thing of these things are first and foremost God's and so I do with them what he calls me to do, what he asks me to do. It's not for me. But then the second thing that was really important, he says that God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. All of this should be motivated by the grace and love of God that is in us. You see, because we love God because he loved us first. We, love, we care for others because he cared for us first. We share with others because Christ shared of himself for us. And so if our pursuit of this radical community is not based upon the gospel and God's radical love for us, then it will simply become another task to complete, another obligation to fulfill, another rule to follow. It must flow from a heart that has been radically transformed by the love of Jesus through his gospel. Let's continue last section, verse 46. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You see, this is actually kind of an indication that the early church still kind of had a, somewhat of a Jewish character to their worship. You see, daily appearance and attendance at the temple was a regular thing for those who lived in Jerusalem. But this seemed to go beyond just a regular meeting at the temple. They were meeting in each other's houses and they were having meals together. It shows that this, they had great joy in gathering together. It's this amazing concept of what's happening here. And then it says, secondly, that they're praising God. Everything, you have to understand this, everything flows from our praise of God. Everything connects back to it for who God, praising God for who he is and what he has done. Because it is ultimately him who has accomplished all of this. He created us to know him. He provides for our needs. He sent Christ to pay for our sins when we rejected him. He gave us new life when we put our faith in him. He poured out his spirit in our hearts so that we could live for him. This is all done by him. And so as a result of their behavior and the praise of God, look at this. It says they were enjoying the favor of all the people, not just other believers. And so there actually can be a definite attractiveness about Christians that people see if we live the way that Jesus designed us to live, if we go with this radical community, follow through with these marks. Because look at this. This is Daryl Bach says this. A vibrant community extends itself in two directions, toward God and toward neighbor. You see, our love for God and appreciation for what he has done should necessarily lead us to care for our brothers and sisters in Christ, as we talked about all the other earlier. And so this is something that the Apostle John talks about in depth in the book of 1 John in the New Testament. He actually says, if you don't love one another, you don't know God. Those are strong words. And then lastly in this verse, it says, the Lord was adding, their, adding to their number daily those who were being saved. Keep in mind two very important things here. First of all, it's God who's the one that's adding to their numbers. It's not the apostles. It's not the others in the community. It's the Lord who is drawing people in. So when you share your faith with people, don't put it all on your shoulders for that person to come to Christ. Ultimately, it is God who is the one that works in their hearts to draw them in to faith. And that really, because of that, there's no need to, to change the message of the gospel or be gimmicky in the way that we present it because it doesn't depend on our efforts but on God being the one changing our hearts. But then secondly, numbers being added daily is not an expected indicator of church success. Rather, this is what we would call a descriptive thing in the Bible rather than a 
prescriptive thing. As in, this is not something that God is calling us to do, that if we don't reach thousands being added daily, then we're, not, we're missing the mark. Rather, it's just simply describing the event that this is what has happened and this is how amazing this is and this is our fourth mark. We need to find joy from consistently gathering together. You see, it's not out of obligation or guilt or fulfilling a duty, but because Jesus has so radically changed us to see that we need to be around our brothers and sisters in Christ for mutual encouragement and that hearing God's word preached and worshiping God through song all contribute to our growth as his disciples. And notice how this was a joyous thing for them to get together. And I think many of us would admit that especially in a culture with a myriad of entertainment options, we would sometimes much rather do a lot of other things besides waking up on a Sunday morning and coming to church, if we're honest with ourselves. But we need to reorient our thinking around this idea. See, when I was in high school, I heard a youth speaker named Steve Argue speak on this in the Bible. This was an amazing quote. I wrote it down in my Bible I had at the time. I don't have it anymore, but this is what he said. Church is not something that I go to. Church is something that I am. You see, we have to realize we are the church. It's not just something we go to. We must realize that we are not mere attenders of a church service, but participants in God's great mission to rescue the world. And one of the ways that we participate in that mission is by coming together as the community, by devoting ourselves to Jesus, by caring for one another, by radically being generous these are the things that mark our mission. And so when you consider and look at this, this might look like this utopia that was being built, but there's something so much more at play here. This is God's creation and intention for his people to be like this. This is what he designed us for. You see, the community I've been talking about today is what is not just some idealistic thing that, oh, that could happen someday. It's something that God has designed and created us to do, to be a part of a community of people who are encouraging each other to follow Christ more closely and working together to bring more people to Christ. And so, how will you show that church is not just something you go to, but something that you are? In what way will you act in radical generosity towards your brothers and sisters in Christ to care not just for their relational needs, but their physical and spiritual needs as well? And in what way will you seek to grow with others to become more like Christ? Because we need to remember that putting our faith in Christ places us into a radical community that is generous, devoted to Jesus, and devoted to caring for one another. Let's pray. God, we just thank you so much for this morning. We thank you that you are a God who deeply cares for us. And God, that you can, through your spirit radically transforming us, bring about a community of people who are united together, who recognize that we are on mission together, but God, also that we need to be on mission for each other, to care for one another's needs, praying for each other, meeting with each other, fellowshipping, breaking bread, praying together, seeking your direction. God, help us to do all of those things. And we pray this in your name. Amen.